The school of Tyrannus is based on the book of Acts chapter 19 verses 9 and 10. Paul took 12 disciples, individuals who had an experience in the baptism of John, but had no real foundation in Christ. And he taught them the word of the Lord and the school of one Tyrannus. And the Bible says, within the space of two years, all of Asia heard the word of the Lord. It's a platform for deepening our spiritual understanding, resulting in spiritual growth and development. And I believe God that for each one of us, that will be our experience in the name of Jesus Christ. Therefore, I welcome you to the School of Tyrants. Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of the School of Tyrannus. Let's begin with prayer. Our Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you today for this opportunity that you have given to us to be together and to learn at your feet as we go through your word. We ask that you open our eyes, that your spirit will guide us and teach us in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for it. In Jesus' precious name we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. For all those who are joining me for the first time, I want to appreciate your presence and to thank God for you. Um, this is an opportunity for us to explore God's word together. As we get into the details of the scripture, line upon line and precept upon precept, and I trust the Spirit of God will open our eyes today in Jesus' name. For all those who are returning um, to this platform again, I want to welcome you one more time. Uh, please, everyone, grab your Bible, grab a notebook or whatever you're taking your notes with, whether it's a tablet or whatever the case may be, and let's get ready. For a deep dive in God's word. We'll be looking at the book of Ephesians and we're going line upon line from chapter 1. And here we are in the last chapter of this book. God has been faithful, so many lessons, and here we are in episode 24. Can you believe it? This is truly the goodness of God. I will give him the glory. So we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 6. And this time we have a little bit of a long reading from verse 10 to verse 18. So quickly grab your Bible and let's dive into God's word for today in the name of Jesus. Okay, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having a, on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all. Taking the shield of faith, wherewith you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. The Lord bless the reading of His Word in the name of jesus all right this subject we're looking at today is a new one the last three sessions we looked at saturated by the spirit but here we are looking at a different subject i call it dynamics of spiritual warfare dynamics of spiritual warfare we're going to go quickly into the introduction and see a number of things that the holy ghost will show us and i trust that our eyes will be open in the name of jesus now every believer must realize first that we are in a battlefield life is a battlefield it's something that we ought to make sure we remind ourselves of all right matthew 11 and verse 12 says from the time of john the baptist till now the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force now this battle is largely a spiritual battle all right now we're, we're reading quite a number of verses today so quickly i want you to turn to second corinthians chapter 10 verse 3 and verse 4 We'll read the ones that we can. Some of them, we'll just quote them for time's sake and quickly move on. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3 and verse 4. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not walk after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So, according to scripture, we are in a spiritual battle. And believers are not exempted from this battle. In fact, the truth is that Satan takes particular interest in believers. Do you know that? Now, Revelation chapter 12, 
the Bible shows, chapter 5, sorry, the Bible shows us this. Um, sorry, I meant Revelation 12. Revelation 12 and verse 17. Okay, it says, And the dragon was wrought with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandment of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So everyone who actually has the testimony of Jesus, the devil is very interested. He sees you as an enemy. We are in a battlefield. Life is a battlefield. We have an adversary. The Bible tells us that our adversary, the devil, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, he goes around like a roaring lion, looking for whom he may devour. You see, your perspective in the war front determines how, how well you are able to survive if you think it is time of peace in a time of war you are likely to fall a victim so you must understand that you need to have a mentality that is in line with the reality of the battle that you are confronted with we have an enemy that is loose and that is the devil himself his intention is to inflict all kinds of assault against the people of god so we must understand that we are invested in this battle it is a real battle it is a it is a it's a battle that is against principalities and powers. Those are agents of the devil. We saw that in verse 12 of Ephesians chapter 6. So we are involved in a very tenacious fight. The enemy, the devil, is against everyone that is a child of God. But the Bible makes us understand that we are going to only be victorious on the basis of God's strength. So we saw in Ephesians 6 and verse 10, it said, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. So our, our ability to win the battle is not in our natural capacity. No, but it's actually in the ability of God. So it means that you and I have a responsibility to position ourselves appropriately with God. Remember, the Bible says something about God. That He gives power to the faint. And to them that have no might, He increases their strength. So God gives ability to those that lack it. He gives strength to those that lack it. So no matter what you are confronted with, you must come to understand that your only way of winning this battle is your connection to God. And that's why the Bible says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So it's a spiritual battle against the devil and his cohorts. And our only avenue for victory is our connectivity to God. That is why whatever it is that contends with your connectivity to God is trying to subject you to a place of defeat. But you shall not be defeated in the name of Jesus Christ. All right, Ephesians 6, we saw in verse 11, it says, the only way for us to therefore win this battle is to put on the whole armor of God. So there is an armor that God has given to us in order to give us the opportunity to win the battle. And what we are looking at in this, in this, in this session really is to, is to try to um, uncover what this armor is to, to, so that we can employ this armor in ensuring our victory. Right? This is a passage of scripture that many of us are very familiar with, we have read over the years. And um, maybe you have heard different messages taught, but I trust that the Holy Spirit will open us up to a new dimension of insight as it concerns this subject. And as a result of it, I see each one of us walking in total and complete victory in the name of Jesus. So what are the weapons of our warfare? Remember we saw in um, 2 Corinthians 10 earlier, it says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they are not natural. So to win this battle, we have to have spiritual weapons. What are these weapons? We see it in this portion of scripture and I want us to take particular note of a few of them right now. Number one, the Bible tells us, okay, it says um, verse 14, stand therefore having your loins girth about with truth and having the breastplate of righteousness. Number one weapon here is truth. Truth. And we see that very clearly. Now, truth here, it tells us that we are to have our loins girth about. We are to have everything tied together with truth. Now, truth here has to do with the word of God by which a person lives. Take note of that. The word of God by which a person lives. John chapter 17 verse 17 says, Sanctify them by thy truth, thy word is truth. So the word by which a person lives, when a person is building his life authentically on the word of God, then you are talking about a person that is walking in the truth. I love how John the Apostle put it. Um, thank you, Jesus. Glory to the Lamb of God. This is wonderful. Hallelujah. John put it in a certain way that I love in this scripture. Um, thank you, Lord. I believe it's 2 John. 
It says in verse, verse 1, 2 John verse 1, The other unto the elect lady and to her children whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but all they that have known the truth. For the truth's sake which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Grace be with you and mercy and peace from God and the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly. Look at this verse 4. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. Walking in truth. If you look at this scripture, the application of the word truth from verse 1 all the way down to verse 4, you will see the potency when the Bible talks about the word of God as truth. It's talking about how we invest our entire lives in it as a foundation for it. So it says here, it says that, you know, to the elect lady who I, who I love in the truth and who I own, and not I only, but all they that have known the truth, those who are committed to the truth, it says for the truth's sake we dwell it in us. Because of the truth that is in us, we are bound to do certain things. Right, so it talks about when you talk about the word of God as truth, you are talking about the word of God as a, a foundation upon which you stand, upon which you build. All right, if you looked at the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, when we began the study in Ephesians, in verse 13, it says, In whom also you trusted after you heard the word of truth. So, you see, the word of truth or uh, the word as truth is what we invest, we trust, we invest ourselves in. So, when we're talking about the word of God as truth, we are talking about the word of God upon which an individual invests themselves. It ties every area of his life together. That's why the Bible uses it as a belt. <laughs> All right? It says there, it says that your law is being girded together with truth. Everything tied together on the basis of truth. You see, my brother, my sister, the truth is this. Whether you will be victorious in the battle or not is dependent on how invested you are on the word of God. There are many people who have the word as knowledge. It is in their head, but they have not invested their lives upon it. The word that you don't live by cannot set you free in the time of battle. If you are going to be victorious in battle, you have to be an individual that is planted firmly on the word of God. An individual who is not moved by any other thing, but actually committed to the word of God as a foundation. You know, we're, we're, those of us in this class are already familiar with the book of Matthew chapter 7 verse 24 to 27. I've read it quite a number of times. So I won't read it right now. I want to just highlight points from it. It says there, it said, um, you know, that he that hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who has built his house upon a rock. And when the storm came, the house remained standing because it was founded upon the rock. It could not fall. It could not give way. Many Christians fall apart because they, they, they hear the word, but they have not invested themselves in that word as a foundation. So the word of truth is about an individual that is, you are talking about the word upon which you have planted yourself. You have planted yourself. There's a, there's a passage of scripture I want us to see in 1 Thessalonians that shows us even a bit more about the word as truth. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to the Lamb of God. Glory to the Lamb of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse... Thank you, Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. All right. It says, For this cause we thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually also worketh in you now that believe. I love that. So the word works in those who have already planted themselves in it. It's a two-way thing. You can't expect the word to answer for you if you don't start by planting yourself in it. Where you commit yourself to the dictates of the word of God. This is so important for us to understand. So when we talk about being guided together with truth, we are talking about being planted on the foundation of the word of God as your own true foundation. The unshakable ground upon which you stand. 
This is so important. So for any believer that will be victorious, <laughs> such an individual must be planted in the word of God, must be founded on the word of God, must be guarded by the word of God, must be must be put together by the word of God. God's word must become the, the, the binding agent for every other thing. So all things around the life of a victorious believer stands firmly on the word of God. I love how Sweet Sweet Wigglesworth put it. He said, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I hear. I'm not moved by what I feel, but I'm moved only by the word of God. Glory to God. That is, if you are going to be victorious, you have to be an individual that is continuously and consistently, you know, invested totally in God's word. Invested totally in God's word. I heard the man of God, Kenny Copeland, say something a number of years ago, and it, it helped me so much. He said, he, he made a covenant with God. He said, Lord, I will never bend your word to fit my life, but I will bend my life to fit your word. Whatever your word says is my command to follow. I will bend my life gladly to fit your word. You know, many people are scriptural manipulators. They will bend the Bible. <laughs> they will make it say what is convenient for them. But that is not what God expects of you and of me. He expects us to have the word of God set as our standard of truth. Look at this passage with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Glory to God. Glory to God. There's so much in this, but I'm just going to try to touch on a few things um, so that we can have it in a concise manner in this class. All right. If, if Second Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2. It said, But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craft, craftiness, handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Look at that. We are, we are not handling the word of God deceitfully. We are not bending it to try to make it convenient and okay for us. He says, no, but we are manifesting the truth. We are exhibiting the truth. We have renounced the hidden things of darkness. We have made sure that our lives now are simply exhibitions of the truth of God's word. That's the question that God is asking. You want to be victorious? You don't want to lose the battles of life? You want to, you want to end up as a victor in life? God is asking you a simple question. Are you operating by the truth? Are you manifesting the truth? Are you founded on the truth? Are you, are, you, are you built on the truth? Is the word of God the constitution of your foundation? That's the key. Because if your foundation is sand, which means it's not based on God's word, if it is sand, then you will fall in the day of adversity. Don't forget the Bible says there is an evil day. There is an evil day. There is an evil day. And we are in that season now because in the last days, perilous times will come. We are facing things now that we have never seen in the world before. And this is why you and I need to be positioned for victory. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will open your eyes to give you what it takes to become victorious in the name of Jesus Christ. So, first thing is truth. Number two, number two aspect of our weapon. Glory to God. He said, he said first, your loins gird with truth. Alright, what next does it say? Same verse 14. It says they are having the breastplate of righteousness. So second requirement is righteousness. That's the next piece of ammo. Righteousness. Now this is so important because according to the scripture, we are made to understand that a life of righteousness and holiness is key if you are not going to fall prey to the enemy. Look at what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 35. All right, Isaiah chapter 35. Glory to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Isaiah 35, beginning from verse 8, it says, A highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. I love that. He said, It shall be for those the wayfaring men, no fool shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. 
It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. Thank you, Jesus. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads, and they shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. There is a highway there. It says the highway of holiness. There will be no lion there. There will be no ravenous beast there. He said, but the redeemed will be the ones to walk thereon. So there is a pathway that allows you to be protected and defended from evil. And that is the pathway of righteousness. Don't forget we are made to understand clearly in scripture, the entire world lies in a magnetic field of wickedness. First John 5 verse 19, it said the entire world hangs in a place of wickedness. But he that keepeth himself, I love this, the wicked one toucheth him not. Let's look at that. First John chapter 5 verse 19. Glory to God. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. First John 5 and um, verse 19. He said, and We know that we have God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Look at that. It says in verse 20, and we know that the Son of God, the Son of God is come and has given us understanding that we may know him that is true, and that we uh, we are in him that is true, even in his son Jesus Christ, that is the true God. And eternal. But look at verse. Let's let's start from verse 18. I like this. It says, We know that whosoever is born of God sinned not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and the wicked one toucheth him not. <laughs> and the whole world lies in wickedness. The whole world lies in wickedness. But we who are of God should demonstrate our being of God in that we don't operate in sin. So let's take verse 18 and verse 19 together. He said, we know that, the, that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God does what? He keepeth himself, and as a result of that, the wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. So the entire world is a magnetic field of wickedness. But the Bible says that even though it's a magnetic field of wickedness, it said those who are of God, they will prove it by ensuring that they keep themselves. They protect themselves from the things that defile. You see, the truth is this. One of the easiest ways to defeat is to surrender to sin. The moment you surrender to sin, you have surrendered to defeat. You know, the breastplate was what in the Roman, you know, warfare attire was what was put over the chest region of the soldier. Because if you wanted to kill a soldier, what you needed to attack was either the head or the chest. When you attack the chest, that soldier was likely going to die. So for your chest to be protected, for your, for your, for your work with God to be protected, for your stand in the kingdom to be protected, you needed this, this, this breastplate, this, this vital aspect of your armory that will defend your internal organs from disruption. If you don't want to get destroyed in spiritual battle, you need righteousness to protect you. Righteousness is a vital necessity in protecting us in our work with God. Now, somebody may say, but pastor, how can you be talking about righteousness as necessary for our protection? Are you talking about personal righteousness or the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? I'm saying this. When a man becomes born again, he receives of Christ the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. All right, according to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20 and 21. But that righteousness, you, see, you are saved by grace, not by works. Very important. So, we are saved by grace. That grace gives us access to this righteousness that comes from God. But, having received that righteousness, you have a responsibility to live righteously. So, you have a righteous gift, but then you must also have a righteous life. First John 3, 7, He that doeth righteousness is righteous. If I give you a white shirt, like the one I'm wearing right now, and I give it to you brand new, it's white. For that shirt to remain white, if it is being used, it must be continuously maintained and cleaned. So if you don't clean it, it will begin to change its color. In the same vein, you have righteousness given to you by Christ Jesus, but you must exhibit righteousness by how you live. Your daily lifestyle is what maintains what God has given to you. 
So the Bible says he that does righteousness is righteous. This is so important. So it's important to know that we have this responsibility to begin to demonstrate righteous works, righteous living in all that we do. That's why the Bible makes us to see that when you look at Jesus as our example, you no, know, I've been trying to establish the fact that Jesus must be your example in all things. You find out that Jesus' victory was the product, among other things, of him maintaining his righteousness. Do you know that? If Jesus surrendered to sin, he could never have been an adequate sacrifice for us. Because the sacrifice that will be acceptable to God is the sacrifice that is without spot or blemish. And Jesus came to offer that. But guess what? He's also coming for a church that is without spot or wrinkle. So which means that we also must begin to exhibit the same kind of righteousness we saw in Christ Jesus. That is the expectation of God. And that is what allows us to be victorious in battle. You know, even your faith will be punctured when you live a life that is not righteous. The Bible says to us clearly, He said, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. But if our heart condemns us not, then we have confidence towards God. John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 20 and verse 21. So clearly in scriptures we are made to see that if you want to be confident in battle and not become you are not succumb to the assault of the enemy, you need to maintain a lifestyle of righteousness. You see, many many people know. <laughs> I've shared this story many times. A man came to me some years ago. He said, Pastor, there, there, there's witchcraft witchcraft activity in my office and so forth. I want you to pray. So I began to tell him, are you born again? He said, yes. Uh, are you are a believer? He said, yes. I said, do you know you have authority? I began to talk to him about the authority of the believer in Christ. And he looked at me and smiled. <laughs> and he said, Pastor, I know why I say you should pray. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, I know why I say you should pray. He said, I do certain things you see that are not godly and so forth. So I know why I said you should pray. When he said that, I smiled because I understood what he was saying. What he was saying was simple. The lifestyle I live. I also know that I've compromised my ability to be able to stand with authority as a believer. Which means that when you live a life of compromise, you will naturally, you know, short-circuit your authority in the kingdom. And as a result of that, you will find yourself becoming a victim to the assault of the enemy. If you want to win the battle, therefore, maintain a life of righteousness. May God grant us grace for it in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, so now, what is the third thing the Bible shows us? So we said number one was what? Truth, number two, righteousness. What is number three? Number three, the Bible shows us this. Ephesians chapter 6, let's move on now to verse 15. And your feet short with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Glory to God. Number, th number three is the gospel. <laughs> you, want to, you want to win the battles of life. You have to have a priority for the gospel. Now, you must realize that the real battle of the devil is against the gospel. That is what the devil is most intent on stopping. When the defeat of Satan was complete by Christ, the enemy's total strategy changed to focus on stopping the advancement of the gospel. The gospel is what the devil is ultimately against. That's why Paul said in Romans 6, 1 verse 16, he, says, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. So if you look at this scripture, and there are so many renderings of it, I went through a number of commentaries as I was studying, and I saw some very important things. But most important is the fact, you know, the Bible calls it the preparation of the gospel. So it talks about readiness with the gospel. If you want to win the battles of life, you must have readiness with the gospel. What's the gospel? The good news. The good news about Jesus. Advertising Jesus in spite of all kinds of opposition. You see, that is one of the keys to us being victorious as believers. Paul says something to Timothy. He said, preach the word in season and out of season. In season and out of of season. So the gospel as our as our shoes is what we should be ready to walk in at any point in time. At any point in time. You know the Bible says something in the book of Romans 10 and verse 15. It tells us there, it says how beautiful are the feet of them that go bearing good tidings. 
all right very good tidings and going around preaching the gospel having having a readiness with the gospel at every point in time you see that is a weapon that many of us are not aware of if you want to win the battles you must ensure that you are ready with the gospel at every point in time thank you jesus you know when the early apostles had the Holy Ghost come upon them. The Bible says um, in chapter 4 that they began to threaten them. Acts chapter 4. And then look at what it says in verse um, verse 18 to 20. Acts chapter 4, 18 to 20. All right. And they called them and commanded them not to speak, not to teach in the name of Jesus Christ. Look at that. <laughs> the gospel is about Jesus. And now they said, don't talk about Jesus. And they said, but Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken to you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak of the things which we have seen or heard. Please hear this. As a believer, you have to be ready with the gospel at all times. It's so important. The world we live in today is such that it seems like the gospel is an offense. But that's the truth. The Bible tells us the gospel will be an offense. So talking about the gospel as an offense, I want us to see something in the Bible from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And you see what the Bible is saying here, verse 18. It says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? And so forth. And then go down to verse 22. He said, The Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block. Unto the Greeks it is foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So when we talk about the gospel, it is offensive. People will see it as foolishness, as a stumbling block, but we must be ready with it at every point in time. Jesus said, if you are ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you. So we've got to come to the point where we recognize that our battle is for the advancement of the gospel. Whatever can silence your voice for the gospel has brought you to the point of defeat. Please understand that. That is why your voice for the gospel must never be silenced, must never be brought to the point of silence. You must recognize wherever you are, you are a representative of Christ. And you are there as an ambassador for the advancement of the gospel. That's what the apostles were saying when we looked at that scripture in Acts chapter 4. They were saying simply, whether it is right for us to obey you or to obey God, you judge. But we cannot but speak of the things that we have heard and we have seen. Now, something happened in Acts chapter 5. I want us to take note of Acts chapter 5. The Bible tells us this about the same apostles now, verse 28 to verse 32. Thank you, Jesus. It tells us there um, in verse 28, it says, saying, did we not straightly command you, that's the Pharisees, did we not command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. That's speaking about Jesus. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus from whom he slew and hanged on a tree. Him has God exalted with his right hand to be prince and savior for to give repentance to israel and forgiveness of sin and we are his witnesses of these things and so is also the holy ghost whom god has given to them which will be so you look at all of this the bible makes it clear they were resisted but they continued to make sure that their voice for the gospel was never brought to silence. I want you to understand that you may be tested, you may be resisted, you may seem to be opposed, but your voice for the gospel must never be allowed to be brought to the point of silence. The Bible is very clear in telling us that though there may be adversaries, we must never allow ourselves to be silenced. Luke chapter 21. Thank you, Jesus. Luke 21. Let's look at this. In um, verse 15 of this scripture it says for i will give you a mount and wisdom which your adversaries will not be able to gain say nor resist so there is god has given us this opportunity to have utterance so that we can speak the gospel boldly at every point in time we're not looking at this today but in the next lesson we'll look at how paul was asking for prayer that he may be able to be bold to make known the mystery of the gospel you see, must understand that no matter what you are confronted with if you if you are silent if you are silent as far as the gospel of christ is concerned you have been defeated already to be victorious 
your shoes must be the gospel it means everywhere you go you are an ambassador of the gospel you are advertising jesus you are an instrument on his behalf no matter what people think about it how offended they may be recognize who you are and recognize that you are to be that ambassador wherever you find yourself may god grant us grace for this in the name of the lord jesus christ all right let's move on now let's move on all right ephesians 6 let's look at the next aspect of the weapon that is required for our victory so we said number one weapon was truth number two was righteousness number three the gospel and number four let's look at this verse 16 above all taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked so the fourth weapon is faith Faith is painted in this scripture, very surprisingly, is painted as a defensive weapon. It calls it a shield. Now, this shield is not, you know, um, looking at some of the various, um, um, you know, discussions concerning the shield here. It's not, the, it's not what you call a buckler, which is a small circular shield. It was like a full body shield that was utilized by the Roman soldiers. Behind this shield, a soldier could hide. And then when arrows were coming that were already, um, uh, you know, um, fired arrows, the soldiers could hide behind the shield and then the shield would stop the arrows from accessing the soldier. So here we are made to see that faith is for us a weapon of protection. It is a weapon of our defense. That is why we are made to see that if you are going to avoid satanic assault, if you are not going to be assaulted by the enemy, if you are not going to find yourself molested by the devil, then you need to operate by faith. That's why we are told to fight the good fight of faith. All right. So in other words, if you are not using, if you are not engaging your faith, it's not a good fight. You are going to find yourself in the place of injury and defeat. You will find yourself at the mercy of the enemy. So our faith becomes a central requirement for our victory. All right, a central requirement. If you look at First Peter, chapter five, we you know the Bible says there, verse eight: Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is going around like a roaring lion, looking for whom to devour. It says in verse nine: Whom resist steadfast in the faith? Hide behind your faith. Use your faith as an instrument to si to to silence his fiery darts. He said, knowing that the same temptation is accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So God is making us to see that you see what you are facing, others are facing also. But you must understand that your faith is your defense. It is your defensive mechanism that encapsulates you from the assault of the enemy. Satan may seek to reach you, but when your faith refuses to fail, you are untouchable. You know what Jesus said concerning Peter. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan seeks to sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. In other words, anytime you find a person who is subjected to the enemy, who is at the mercy, let me put it that way, who has come to the, who is at the point where he's at the mercy of the enemy, it is traceable to a faith failure. Your faith is your protection. Your faith is your defense. That is why you and I have the responsibility to continue to build our faith. Build our faith. Because when you build your faith, what it means is that you are, you are encapsulated by God. Remember we have said earlier that in order to win this fight, you must understand that it's not your ability that you need to use. It's God's ability. It's not your armor, it's God's armor. It's made available to you and to me. But we engage that by faith. Remember I said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So you want to be victorious, you must understand you have a responsibility to have yourself connected to God by faith. It is faith that makes you hide behind God so that the assaults of the enemy are not able to reach you. You are encapsulated, defended, protected. You are in the secret place of the Most High. You are abiding under his shadows and therefore as a result of that a thousand may fall on one side 10,000 on the other side, but it's not allowed to come near you. That will be your experience in the name of Jesus. So your faith must never be allowed to fail. Your faith must never be allowed to fail. When your faith fails, it's like your shield coming down. And when your shield comes down, the arrows of the enemy are able to make a direct hit. The enemy will not be able to make a direct hit on you or your family in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what God is showing us here, therefore, is simple. Your faith. Refuse to let your faith fail. And remember, faith is built only one way. It's built by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So where there is no entrance of God's word, there will be exit of faith. 
<laughs> where there is no entrance of God's word, there will be exit of faith. If you want your faith to keep growing, keep making sure the word of God is entering into you, building up yourself in faith. It's so important. If you build yourself in faith, you are building yourself for victory because faith is the victory. Why is it the victory? You are encapsulated in God. When you are hidden in God, you are untouchable by any assault, any assault of the enemy. I see that becoming your experience in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Now, next, we are used to the aspect of faith a little bit. So let's move on and look at what the Bible shows us next. It says, next, what does it say to us? Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation take the helmet of salvation as i meditated upon this i began to wonder what is he talking about here the helmet of salvation and i discovered something i want to show you this so that you see what it means here by salvation first thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 8 thank you jesus i i believe you are being blessed because the holy ghost is teaching us and opening our eyes to the light of the gospel all right first thessalonians chapter 8 chapter 5 sorry I say that first Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 8. Good. He said, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, take note, the hope of salvation. So that was talking about the person who just got born again. Is talking about the hope of salvation. You know, we have the salvation that we receive in terms of our, you know, entrance into the kingdom, in terms of our acceptance to the family of God. But here is talking about another experience, which is talking about our final entrance into heaven, our final entrance into our eternal rest. Put it that way. So it's talking about a hope of eternity. What is God saying? If you want to be victorious in life, you must understand that you need to have, you need to live life, sorry, in the light of eternity. In the light of eternity. You cannot be focused on only the here and now. Many people are not aware or not conscious of eternity. Look at how the Bible puts it in the book of Colossians chapter 3. Verse 1 to 3. He said, If you be risen with Christ, look at this, seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. So let your gaze be focused on God. That's what he's saying there. He said, Set your affection on things that are above and not the things on the earth. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. So he's talking about living in the light of eternity. Many things that people succumb to on the earth is because they are not living in the light of eternity. If you are focused on heaven, if your eyes are focused on the things that are above, you will discover that your lifestyle will begin to exhibit certain realities. A man whose eyes are focused on Jesus will, you know, will not succumb to certain things. You don't find yourself living in sexual immorality. You don't find yourself falling a victim of stealing because your eyes are on eternity. Your focus is on the world to come. Your eyes are where Jesus is, not here on the earth. I like you to understand that God has many blessings for us on the earth, but we are pilgrims here. This is not our ultimate destination. When a person becomes too worldly in their view, they will lose view of eternity. And that's what happens and this is the reason why many individuals fall victim in their race. They become you know, exposed to the enemy because they are so focused on the temporal. Somebody will say, Pastor, how, how does focusing on eternity, for God's sake, how does that now, um, how does that protect me in battle? <laughs> you must understand this. When you are focused on the things on the earth, you are open to satanic assault. Let me show you one example, for example. Just one example. All right. The Bible says something. First John. Look at this. First John chapter 2. The scriptures are so sweet because if you follow them, they will help you to live a life um, that is unique on the earth. First John chapter 2. Look at this. Verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is telling us what's in the world now. What is in the world? The loss of the flesh, 
the loss of the eyes, the pride of life, is not in the is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passeth away, and the loss thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So that's First John two, verse fifteen to seventeen. So it tells us in the world you have the loss of the eyes, the loss of the flesh, and the pride of life. These are the things that are in the world, lusting after things, desiring after things continuously. The loss of the eyes. That has to do usually with covetousness. A life that is not content. But what happens when you are exposed to certain things like that? When you live with a worldly view, when your focus is on the earth, not on heavenly, or not on heaven, but on the earth alone. What happens? Let's look at one example. So we said they have the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life so the loss of the eyes among other things has to do with covetousness now what happens when a person is overly consumed by the desire for physical or material things where he becomes covetous what happens first timothy chapter 6 you will see how this is an assault point it's an opening for the enemy it's an opening for the enemy look at this first timothy chapter 6 thank you jesus it tells us this all right hmm verse 8 he said for having food and raiment let us be there with content he said but they that will be rich those who, are, who, who will force themselves to find money one way or the other he said they fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lust which drown men in destruction and perdition you see that just by that he said verse 10 for the love of money is the root of all evil where which some which while some converted after they erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows all kinds of problems traceable to the fact that the lust of the eyes are there people are not content they become covetous they are consumed by what others have so they lose their rest they lose their rest they lose their rest you know today look at look at the world we live in you know um, a new phone comes out you lose your rest about the current one it's not good again. It's not uh, my phone is dropping calls. It's not dropping calls. <laughs> you are the one dropping the call. The problem is that something new has come out, and suddenly you have lost contentment with what you have. All right, you have lost contentment with what you have. You know, um, clothes now come out in seasons. All right, so you have you know certain um, designs that come out, certain styles that come out in different seasons. So in the spring season, for example, new designs for the year usually will come out around the world. And then it puts pressure on people because suddenly all they had last year is no more is no more stylish enough. <laughs> right? So there is this desire to have more, to have more. And as a result of that, you open yourself to the assault of the enemy. People don't know that this is one of the reasons why people many times fall victims. They are victims of the enemy because they have lost focus on eternity and they are now concentrated on the temporal. The eternal should be our focus. The temporal, God gives us things to comfort us here. The Bible says He gives us all things richly to enjoy. So God will bless you on the earth. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you should live a life of penury on the earth. No. God has a prosperous plan. You are to live a life of distinction on the earth. You are to prosper. But don't become consumed by the material. Don't become consumed. Your car does not define you. Your house does not define you. Your clothes do not define you. You are defined by the greater one that lives in you. Your real identity is as branded in Christ. I love how Paul put it. He said, let no man trouble me. I love it. He said, because I bear upon my body the mark of Christ. I'm branded by Christ. That's my identity. That's who you are. If you are a child of God, you are identified with Christ. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about you. The reality of the fact is that your eternal view should be what drives you. Hallelujah. You should be continuously consumed by, you know what? I can't feel inferior to anybody. Why? Because I have the ultimate. That is Christ Jesus. When you have him, you have nothing to envy. Please hear that. You have nothing to envy. You may have only one pair of clothes that you are wearing, but you have nothing to envy. It is not the cover of a package that determines the value, it's the content. The content. The content. When you have the reality of knowing that I have Christ living in me, I have an eternity to gain, then you begin to experience a life of victory because you are not open to the assault of the enemy. The, the various vices of hell cannot reach out to you. 
Hallelujah. I see God granting us grace to live life every day in the light of eternity. When you wake up in the morning, keep reminding yourself, Christ is there on the throne. He's seated by the Father. My eyes and my affection are on the things that are above. I love the things above. I don't love the things that are on the earth. I can enjoy them. God gives me for enjoyment, but not to love them. Please hear this. Hear it very well. To stop saying I love this car, I love this house, I love this uh, clothes. You don't, you don't put a human emotion on, um, on, on a physical or material thing, something that has no life. No, you, you may, you may enjoy it. Yes, God gives you to enjoy, it, but not to love. Don't love it. The Bible says, love not the world on the things that are in the world, because if you do, the love of the Father is not in you. Hallelujah. So I, I pray that God will grant us this grace. But this is what he's talking about here when he talks about the helmet of salvation. He said that one will protect your head. And anything that, he, that is able to penetrate your head has already broken down the entire body. All right. So it, for your head to be kept and um, you know impenetrable by the enemy, you need a helmet of salvation, the helmet of the hope of salvation, an expectation of eternity, a you know, a focus on things to come. That's the key to living a life of victory. Glory to Jesus. So we have said you have the um, you have salvation or the hope of salvation, which is another one of our weapons. And let me move on quickly. We have the word of God. Somebody may say, how, Pastor, how can you say the word of God? Okay, look at verse 17. It said, um, Ephesians 6 and verse 17. Glory to God. It says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. It's interesting that we spoke about first <laughs> the truth. And we even spoke about the gospel, which all look like we're talking about the word of God. And then here, we're talking about the word of God. But they are all different weapons. When we talked about truth, we talked about what you plant your life on top. The things that you have as a foundation for living. When we talked about the gospel, we talked about you know, being ready with the gospel to preach anywhere that you go as an agent of Christ. But here when we talk about the word of God as an instrument, we are talking about it as an offensive weapon. You know, the Bible says, the sword of the spirit. I like that. Which is the word of God. Most of the things we have spoken about so far were about your protection. But now we're talking about your assault. What you attack the devil with is God's word. All right? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Look at this. Glory to God. Glory to Jesus. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. Jesus is Lord. Okay. Le verse 12, sorry. It says, The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So the word of God is likened there to a weapon, sharper than any two-edged sword. He said, um, piercing even the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So the word of God is shown to us there as a weapon. It pierces, you know, the impenetrable. So you can utilize the word of God to win the battle against the enemy. So while the other things we have looked at protect you from the assault of the enemy, the word of God gets you the victory. It wins the battle. Now think about this. When the devil came against Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, look at it very closely. Every statement, what brought the devil down was, it is written. He kept coming back with the word. Let's look at that. Matthew chapter 4. Thank you, Jesus. Matthew chapter 4. Oh Lord, I give you praise. Matthew chapter 4. And let's look at a few verses. We'll just pick them quickly. Satan came and began to tell him, If you are the Son of God, command the stones to become bread. Verse 4. He said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And then also, Satan came, and the Bible says, He took him to a high temple. He said, Now cast yourself down. And then what did Jesus say? Verse 7. It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. Satan again said, Now bow to me, worship me. And verse 10, Get thy hands, for it is written, thou shalt, not, thou shalt worship the Lord your God, and him only shall thou serve. And the Bible says, Then Satan liveth him alone. To win the battle against the devil, you need the word of God as an instrument of assault. Hallelujah. You need the word of God as an instrument of assault. Something is attacking your health attacking you know any area of your life attacking your spiritual life you take god's word and you begin to use it as an instrument against the devil 
Don't just protect yourself. Assault the enemy back. Why? Because without an assault, you cannot bring him, you bring him to silence. If you keep hiding from the devil and he's throwing weapons at you, he's throwing arrows at you, you see, if you just keep hiding, the arrows will continue. But when you rise up to assault him back with the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, you bring him to silence. Satan, I mean, Jesus gave the devil just three strokes. One, it is written. Two, it is written. Three, it is written. And the devil lived him alone. Departed from him and he walked into victory. You see, if you are now going to be victorious, we've got to recognize how to utilize the word of God to silence the assault of the devil. Utilize the word of God to silence the assault of the devil. That assault on your health, you can silence it by the word of God. The assault on your marriage, you can silence it by the word of God. The assault on your business, you can silence it by the word of God. The assault on your Christian work, that satanic accusation that is trying to push you out of your work with God, you can silence it by the word of God. So take God's word like stones. Take the word of God like a sword and begin to approach the enemy to silence him with the word. When you do that, you walk into total victory. So we can see that the armor is loaded with six vital aspects or instruments one truth two righteousness three the gospel four faith five salvation or the hope of salvation and then six the word of god when you employ this comprehensively you cannot but be victorious in life you see god has ordained you for victory and you will not lose any battle again in the name of jesus now that being said i want us to understand this employing all of these weapons requires one thing in verse 18 it says praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit so you engage all of these you put it on as i've mentioned you put it on that way you you found your life on truth you have put on uh, the belt of truth you you begin to operate um, by righteousness the breastplate is there when you begin to um, preach the gospel the shoes are on when you begin to operate in faith the shield is up when you begin to um to, to live in light of eternity, the helmet is on. And then when you begin to assault the enemy by throwing the word of God at him, suddenly the sword is out. But the Bible says, with all of these things in place, make sure you remain in prayer. Prayer is the key to victory. Jesus said to Peter, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan seeks to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. I have prayed for you. Matthew 26 and verse 41. I have prayed for you. So it takes prayer to maintain victory. If you are going to be victorious against satanic intention, you must learn the necessity of prayer. All right, look at Luke chapter 21 with me. Okay, Luke 21 verse 36. It says, Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. If you want to escape the fall that is coming to many, the defeat that is coming to many, he said, watch and pray always. That word always is the same word that is used in Ephesians 6 and verse 18, praying always. So prayer must be a continuous lifestyle. It's not something you do once and for all, but something you do as a lifestyle. When that becomes the case, you are positioning yourself for victory. Well, I know that from this day onward, you will not be a victim of defeat again in the name of Jesus Christ. All right, it's important to say this as I begin to conclude today. For you to enjoy all that we have spoken about, you first require salvation. Without salvation, you are already marked out for defeat. The enemy already has you. He has already positioned himself to victimize you, to assault you. But God has a way of escape for you. And that way is salvation. Here, salvation, I'm not talking about just the light of eternity. I'm talking about getting into Christ now. I'm talking about being born again. I'm talking about being a child of God. I'm talking about being genuinely one that is in the family of God. Also, there are those who are hearing me today and watching and you have actually had this experience of salvation. You have had this redemptive experience, but something went wrong along the way. And maybe you just went off course. 
and you're saying i want to return so that i can be restored by jesus this is your opportunity i want you to follow these instructions coming up next and i'll be returning back with some closing comments real life begins when christ lives within you cannot have a fulfilling life without christ if you want to give your life to jesus or to rededicate your life to him please pray this prayer after me lord jesus i come to you today as a sinner i cannot help myself but i know you died for me on the third day you rose again just to save me jesus come into my life as my lord and savior take control of me from this day forward i will follow you no turning back and i will serve you no turning back thank you jesus for saving me amen now i pray for you father in the name of jesus i thank you for each of these precious ones that have responded to this call today i ask that you grant each one grace to continue to walk with you all the days of their lives that none of them will turn back from following after you and that the fulfillment they desire will begin to manifest in every area of their lives in the name of jesus thank you father for it in jesus precious name amen congratulations and welcome to the family of god wow praise the lord what a joy it is for you to have taken such a decision it is the greatest decision that you could have taken having jesus as lord and savior is the best thing anyone can do with his life so i congratulate you once again now receive this word of blessing then the name of jesus be blessed the hand of god will rest upon you the blessing of god surrounds you the peace of god on every side you will never lack the help of god all things begin to work together for your good and welcome to a realm of victory every defeat in your life is overturned for victory today in the name of jesus christ amen and amen thank you so much for joining me today i want you to please ensure that you subscribe if you have not done so yet make sure you share it so it can be available for others and then also make sure you like it so that like this video so that others can take advantage of it as well well until i see you next time keep walking in the great light god bless you and bye